So this, this is the first time we ever played out in public. Um, I'll show you a much less flattering version of it. Um, the term Blyborg there is, uh, it's a personal joke that I find totally hilarious, but I don't know if anybody else does, because um, Robert Bly, who was a like, mythopoetic men's group guy, like going out in the woods and getting naked and hugging and drumming, and, um, but his, he was really into this like sort of primal revisiting of, of like sort of masculine nature and um, so to me this is sort of like um, a drum circle version 2.0 is what I've been calling it um, and if you're interested to check it out it happens tomorrow night at Backspace which is an all ages venue um, right downtown on 5th in, in Northwest um, and the idea is that it's an open mixer, so people can come in and um, we, I mean, as you can see, I have a lot of stuff and I, I can play a lot of it at once, but um, often I'm only playing one thing, especially when there's a lot of people in the group. So if you don't have your own instruments, we have plenty of instruments that you can play with if you want to come check it out. It's a free event. It's from 8 to 10 on, on, on every other Monday. Um, so here's the raw footage of, of the... Uh, of the event. The guy bouncing around there is Jesse Garcia, he's the other, the other creator. I'm behind the camera. Space, I wanted us to set up in the listening position, which would be often like when you come and perform in a space, they want you on stage. Um, and where I wanted to be was off stage, where you could hear the main speakers in the house the best. Because um, one of the challenges to doing this is I have to like 
maintain a 16 track mixer with all of these sound coming into it and make sure it sounds good in the space. I totally love doing that and I love the challenge of it and sort of the chaos of it. Um, but it's hard to do from, from being on stage. Of course they didn't let us do that. Um, and then when we first went in there, they really wanted us at Backspace, they, they want, turned us up really loud and we start making our like goofy, noisy music and people just totally get cleared out of the space. <laughs> Which, that, that's not a good relationship either because ultimately Backspace has to have its customers, you know, have to stay there and Backspace has a large amount of customers that are just there to drink their coffee and then drink their tea and like, you know, be on Facebook or whatever. And, um, and I'm, I mean, I'm fine with that. I don't, I have no real need of like, you know, that the ego of course wants like to play loud and have the bass be massive. And, um, but the way we end up fixing it is I have them turn it down in the space. And, uh, so we still have our stage monitors that are facing us. And luckily the, the bass speakers, are by the stage, so we also can feel the nice bass presence because bass, bass really sort of like drives the sort of physical or visceral relationship with music. Um, so once we turned it down in the space, all of a sudden it became attractive, which is really interesting to me. So and, and you were there for one of those, yeah, one of those yeah. nights where like we're so you have like five people on stage all playing a bunch of these bizarre little little instruments and um, and uh, people want to know people want to know what is going on you know and since you're not pushing them out of the space and since people can see that something fun is happening and people can hear that something interesting is happening um, they have a choice to come up and interact um, and so that that uh, is starting to catch on, um, but it's still a challenge. I mean, it would be easy if it were just like a users group, or if, or if it were just a performance. But I'm trying to like be both a users group and a performance. Ideally, my goal is is to be like we want at least one Monday a month to be a dance party. Which I mean, a dance party between eight and ten on a Monday. I mean, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but. Um, but we can really bring the beats. Um, we can also bring some really experimental stuff, but we can really bring the beats, and it would be really fun to, I just feel like having this sort of ensemble-based production can really um, create like a community atmosphere in which maybe it's not so much about dancing so you can like look sexy and feel cool, but like it's just about dancing just to have fun and just to be part of a community. Um, so early on I had put out these these, this effects processor, this uh, the chord chaos pad, and I'll go into each one of these things um, in more detail in a sec. And uh, I was really excited to offer these tools because I thought, to me, they're really intuitive. And uh, and to, so to other electronic musicians who have a tendency towards experimentation and towards unusual devices that may not have keyboards attached to them or may not look like a drum or may not look like a guitar, um, it was accessible. But we had one moment where I had these two devices out and this chaos layer makes sound and the, and the chaos pad affects sound that's, that is produced. Um, and we had a couple of girls came up and they were really excited about what we were doing and they like, you know, Weeble their fingers on the XY things, and I could hear exactly what they were doing, but they had no idea like what their what they were doing to the sound, you know. Um, so again, I was like, well, that doesn't work either, because uh, it just it's funny because I I mean you know being being like inside uh, like an idea or or a concept or a or a way of developing music you forget what it's like for the layman you know when you're when you're really into something you know, horses or anything you know you might forget that people are terrified of horses like i think that they're huge scary animals you know but you know somebody that rides them thinks that they're beautiful you know accessible beasts you know so it's sort of the same way with this can so were you saying she actually could not uh, pick out what yeah, she was she doing. Couldn't, it, yeah, she, that, that, you, it's audible. It wasn't that it was, it was the changes were minimal or no, no, no. Just... The changes are really distinctive, but but I think it's what it, it's a coupling of of 
this X Y axis, this touch screen, you know, that like, I mean, it's just like, for a lot of people, they're like, what the hell does that do, you know? Um, so the, I found that the starting point had to be, we started putting out like, you know, your little Casio keyboards that you just put a few batteries in, and, and as soon as we started offering like a single octave or a two octave keyboard, people started really understanding like what was going on. Um, and so we got some pretty good interaction. Um, the other thing that I've had sex, sex, good, good, good Freudian slip. I'll edit that out. Um, the other thing that I've had success with is, uh, I haven't had sex with this, um, <laughs> is this device, which is made by this gentleman uh, out of England that called himself Pixel Hate. And it's basically a keyboard. Of a, of a key. Um, and so I can set, like, if we're playing on this on this device, um, this is running Nano Loop, and on this device is where we, I'll program a lot of my beats out. I'll, sometimes I'll do them on the phone, but basically I'll use, or we can use something like this Chord VS, which I think, I'll just pass this around. You can take a look at it. Feel free to, there's, um, the Nano Loop user's manual is sort of obtuse and not accessible, so I'll just leave it out. But the Korg user's manual is pretty interesting. Um, but it's also a sequencer, so basically meaning that you could write out rhythms on it. Um, so the cool thing is, is with this keyboard, you can set up um, what key you're in, major, minor, harmonic minors, whole, uh, pentatonic scales. Um, you can pick any starting, any root position, which uh, means as long as I know the key that we're playing in, I can set somebody up for this device in such a way that they can make sound that doesn't necessarily, that isn't going to be off key. You know, it might not be rhythmically on, or it might not be the right note at the right time every time, but, um, but often it can sound super, super good. Um, so those things have been recent successes that we've had. Um, also, the Korg Monotron works pretty well because it also has a keyboard so people can sort of get to it. But I find the keyboard, the ribbon controller on here to not be hurt. It's pretty hard to play. Like, you can play like two note or three note things on it, but other than that, it's fairly hard to play. Um, fairly hard to play something musical, I guess. Um, How do you feel about the, the keyboard design, like on electronics, as far as like, you know, trying to simulate the old uh -huh. piano that goes back centuries or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Like, you know, you have people like Don and Buchla. Yeah, like Buchla? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to make these interesting interfaces. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a huge fan of the interesting interface. I mean, that's yeah. the reason I, I'm personally, like, really into these devices because I don't have any traditional musical training. And so, for me, a device that, that has... Uh, Like a touch screen like this uh -huh. is actually very, very fun. <laughs> and again, this, I mean, this device has things where it seems, it's very deep. I mean, you can go in here, you can set your root position of the chord, you can set your scale that you're playing in. It's default to Ionian, but it's got like Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian. I mean, I don't know how much music theory we got going on in the room, but this has got pretty much as much music theory in it as, as, as any music geek could want. Um, for bass lines, I use it for bass lines often. I can just set it to a fifth, and then you're just like. always assured of, of a fifth beat. Of course, you can loop 